You're listening to East of the Rockies, the Michigan Student Softball Podcast on WCBN Sports. Well, Mr. Burns had done it. The power plant had won it. With Roger Clemens clucking all the while. Mike Sosha's tragic illness made us smile. While Wade Boggs lay unconscious on the barroom tile. We're talking softball. From Maine to San Diego, talking softball. Manningly and Canseco. Ken Griffey's grotesquely swollen jaw. Steve Sachs and his running with the law. We're talking Homer. Ozzy and the straw. We're talking softball. And with that abrupt cut, I we know. Would... <laughs> I was going to say, what did that song ever do to you? Yeah, I think usually we fade that one out, but I wasn't ready for it. Anyway, welcome to episode 12 of East of the Rockies, WCBN Sports' Michigan Softball's podcast. My name is Morris Fabri. On the other side of the glass, I have with me Kevin Klein and no Jeremy Parks. This time he's got a pretty valid excuse. He got in a car crash and he no won't excuse. make it. Not an excuse. Well, uh, I, I guess that'll be for him to clear up on the next episode, Lucky 13. Uh, but rest assured, people, he is uh, fine uh, physically, mentally not so sure he ever was. Uh, but we're going to soldier on, just me and Kev, yet again, back in the booth. Uh, and to start, we're going to have to talk about Wisconsin. Michigan went out to Madison last weekend, uh, and the first game seemed like a a sign of the season for the Michigan Wolverines, kind of the season in a microcosm. Megan Betza throws nine shutout innings. Michigan's offense tallies nine shutout innings. Michigan uh, goes scoreless in the top of the 10th. Betza gives up a solo home run to Stephanie Lombardo, Wisconsin's first baseman, a 1-0 defeat. Ten innings, six hits, no runs for this Michigan offense. Yeah, but Betts only gave up two hits and one left the park. It is, It was very frustrating, and, and we'll get into it later. I think the biggest storyline of the whole weekend, though, is that lineup from Saturday's game. And I think this this game had a lot to do with that. But looking at that game, I mean, Betsa showed you what Betsa does best, and she just keeps the team in the game. Uh, and, and basically, aside from a, a scattered solo home run here and there, I, I mean, she is just so dominant this year compared to... I mean, I, it's it's not even fair to her to say like she wasn't dominant her first three years, but... On a different yeah. level, for yeah. sure, this year. And and she's in some type of groove right now, and it's it's a lot of fun to watch. She set her career high in strikeouts that game. <laughs> yeah, you think that she's due for some sort of regression with the ERA dropping weekend after weekend. Now it's down to 1.03 uh, in Big Ten play, 1.30 on the year. 334 strikeouts and 183 innings pitched. Unreal stuff in that game against Wisconsin. Ten innings pitched, two hits, seven walks. You can kind of forgive her for that, uh, but kept the team in the game as long as she could be expected to. In the next game, your starting pitcher for the Wolverines, Leah Crockett. Your starting designated player, freshman Madison Uden. Uh, starting at third base, Alex Subject. Starting at first base, Taylor Swearing and Lindsey Montemarano nowhere to be found. Starting in right field, Haley Hoganrod. <laughs> starting in center field, Natalie Peters. No Kelly Christner in that lineup to start things off. You kind of get the picture. Carol Hutchins shook things up, and Michigan responded in a big way. Yeah, you know, I I uh, I think I was working the baseball game during this game. I didn't get a chance to. Um to to watch it on BTM Plus, but when I saw the lineup, I'm thinking, oh, is it April Fool's Day? Like, I and and at first I said, oh, Ramirez at the top, like that's fine. Like Canfield still in the three hole. I didn't see Christner. I didn't see Montemarano. And then I looked at the starting pitcher and shot. I mean, Leah Crockett only gave up one unearned run until Blanco finished it up. But that was the shakeup that the team needed. I mean, you completely put all your pieces of the puzzle on a blanket and you know throw up the blanket and see what you got and that's what Hutch did and sometimes you just got to go with what Hutch does because she's seen this for 33 years at Michigan when a team kind of slows down and this is something it, I think it's a good time to bring it up and we'll hear it in the Christner interview later is 
she said, Christner did, that this year especially, there's not one or two players where every game two hits. And yeah. that was uh, certainly alluding to Lawrence and Susala and, and, and Romero. This year, there's different hot hitters at different times. Right now, it's Madison Uden. Two weeks ago, it was Amanda Vargas. So why not throw together your pieces in a different order? See if some, a couple of them get hot and roll with it. And that's it. And it worked because 18 runs in the final two games of the series. Yeah, absolutely. In that game, it was kind of, you know, aside from Uden having a hot bet, and really earning more time in the order. It was mostly the usual suspects that you saw getting it done. Faith Canfield, a three-run bomb in that game off of uh, Kirsten Stevens, I believe. Kelly Christner, also a three-run bomb, pinch hitting for Haley Hoganrod. That's probably the last time that she'll ever do that in her career. Uh, But yeah, and then the next game, Michigan comes out business as usual. Blanco, a bomb, three-run shot. 8-0, 8 nothing. bets in the circle, business, I already said business as usual, two run rules to close out the series for, or for the Wolverines against the Badgers in Wisconsin, that's what we've been looking for, that's what we expected maybe at the beginning of the season, and maybe that little shakeup is all it took, but uh, it's a good sign, I'd say. Yeah, and, and you know what? It- People or players who you wouldn't expect to contribute are contributing. Courtney Richardson has refound her groove that we saw at the beginning of the year. She's hitting 375 in Big Ten play. Canfield has been doing it all year long. I mean, Tara Blanco continues to hit over 375 in Big Ten play as well. It's just it the thing is, this team, and I think I am convinced that the offense is potent. It's a good offense, but for some reason, some games, they just go, they can't be found. And I don't know what it is. I can't, I can't pinpoint it. I don't know what it is. I don't know why, but it just happens. Sometimes you run into a pitcher and they can't hit her and that's an issue, but it, it really makes you feel a little better about it when in the final two games of the series when they were really in danger of dropping the series and and not in a good position the offense comes to play and and that's all you could hope for that during the Big 10 tournament during the regional wherever they are placed in the tournament that the offense just comes to play and and they're on a hot streak rather than a cold streak yeah and you, you also got to hope that you know Megan Betza pitches like Megan Betza has pitched which seems like kind of a given but at the same time she has struggled in the postseason the last couple of years you got to imagine that workload might begin to become a factor down the stretch you know what i, I don't know and it maybe but I don't think so because she took the fall off. And I mean, when you talk to her, she said she was on a different workout routine than everybody else to, to help the back, to help uh, keep the stress off of her body. And the one thing that I was, it was funny, I was thinking about it this morning because I knew we were going to talk about uh, the seniors because Sunday is senior day. One thing that I have noticed out of Megan Betza from sophomore year when I really started getting into Michigan sophomore compared to now is she is so much more mature because there were times sophomore year when she was pitching against Florida in the women's college world series, uh, the championship series or whatever they call it. And she would walk a couple batters and then Florida would hit one in and she would just be flustered. Mm -hmm. she She, couldn't control herself she's pretty demonstrative out there in the circle you can tell like you know she 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 wears doesn't wear emotions on her sleeve as much anymore but she's an emotional player but you can but but two years ago florida could get to her teams could get to her in her head and i think now i mean she's completely different more mature she knows how to work around her mistakes or her fielder's mistakes or just not getting a call from an umpire and that's what makes her so dominant and fun to watch yeah, so in the end, Michigan comes out of that Wisconsin series. A big, an impressive run differential. The loss, while it does hurt and while it is a sign of the the problems that have frustrated, frustrated this team over the course of the season, uh, it seems to me like just kind of an unfortunate sort of thing that happens you know i believe as uh as you said random chance yeah you know, a bad bounce yeah i believe you like to say to an extent you know uh but uh the youth movement that started saturday's game and sparked this team uh you think hutch is gonna have to go back to that at any point this season no no the one-time thing i don't that think she, will. I, I don't think she will mm-hmm. but i think 
and and I was I was thinking about this too. I was thinking about a lot of things, a lot of thinking going on. It's really not like me, <laughs> but you can see that the future is bright mm-hmm. because you see what Vargas has done this year. She's a junior, but you also see what the the underclassmen have done. Uh, Natalie Peters, Courtney Richardson at times, Faith Canfield all year long, Madison Uden. Yeah, I mean, geez. Uden finally gets an opportunity and she takes advantage of it. I remember when we talked to her at the very beginning of this season because her sister plays for Indiana and, and I asked, well, you're going to try to have, you know, beg Hutch to get in the lineup. Now she might have to be in the lineup because she's hitting the ball really well right now. Yeah, she has definitely earned a spot. And man, I feel like Faith Canfield, the season that she has been having, it's been incredible. And I, you know, I hate to call it underreported, but, you know, Kelly Christner, or Megan Betts are going to get the headlines for this team. But Faith Canfield has been as consistent as they come, a really huge bright spot for this team. That And it's only gotten brighter as the season has gone on. Extra base power, and that's something that the team has lacked, but Canfield has not. Uh, the ability to drive the ball to the gaps, uh, she fields her position well. Uh, it, it She's a fun player to watch, especially as a sophomore. So what what is to come yeah. In the next two years. Yeah, maybe she did take something from Sierra Romero. Maybe just a little bit. Not quite filling her massive shoes, but, you know, it's showing something. Showing you pick something. up things here and there, I'm sure. <laughs> so uh, over, give, give me an overall grade for the team for their performance over the weekend in Madison. A minus. A minus. Every, every, every aspect of the team was flawless except for the lack of offense on Friday. All they had to do was score two runs. Just score two runs. Score and we're, one run in regulation. Yeah, for the exactly. First nine innings, and yeah. the other thing that's so frustrating is they left the bases loaded, I believe, to the last two innings. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I th- a minus. I think a minus is pretty fair. You know, if this is if this were coming off of the back of a an undefeated Big Ten run coming in, then maybe we could be a little bit harsher. But yeah, it, overall, I'd say you can take some optimistic uh, signs out of that series. Moving forward, the Wolverines no midweek game this week. Uh, they're going to be playing their final home series of the season, uh, a three game set against the Indiana Hoosiers. Uh, Taylor Uden coming to town to take on her sister Maddie, and she's coming in on a hot streak. Uh, the Hoosiers coming in off of a three-game sweep of the mighty Maryland Terrapins. You may be familiar with them. Uh, Indiana moved up to 8-9 in the Big Ten. Maryland dropped to 2-13, and one of those wins coming against Michigan. But we already talked about that ad nauseum. Uden, three multi-hit games in that series. Caramia Cerigos hitting 390 with six home runs in Big Ten play. Indiana's got some weapons coming into alumni. What are some of your expectations for this series, Kev? Well, I mean, I think the emotions are going to be incredibly high. This, Like you mentioned, not the last home game, but the last home series, the Saturday and Sunday are already sold out. Not sure about Friday. That's got to be close to sold out as well. But it should be a fun one. It's a, it's a nice way to send off the seniors. Saturday's Kelly Christner Day at the park, and... Uh, the expectations, I think Michigan just plays so much better at home in front of the fans that they do on the road. Uh, I think this will be a, a sweep. I'm sure there'll be a close game mixed in here and there. Uh, but but I think Michigan really takes advantage of Indiana's pitching. And the reason for that is Indiana doesn't have a pitcher with an ERA under three. Compare that to Michigan's two pitchers, where Betts is at 130 and Blanco's at 207. Michigan's offense, I think, gets to Tara Trainer, Emily Gooden, uh, and Emily Kirk this weekend, and and you see an offensive explosion. Not sure who it's going to come from, uh, but it'll be uh, an offensive explosion. And Blanco's always a good guess. She's been, uh, I think, heating up as this season has gone on. I've been, you know, I've been kind of on the Blanco's going to break out of the slump, Blanco's going to break out train since basically the very beginning of the season, and it's been happening, but, you know, she hasn't had any series where, you know, three home runs in three games sort of thing. Yeah, but you know, and this is kind of a sidebar, you know what a really good series against Wisconsin is Katie Alexander. Yeah. I don't know if you watched any of the games, but she had a triple to the opposite field, a double to the opposite field, just poking everything to right field. Uh, a really good series. Uh, for her, the average is perking up almost a 290 now. So if, if Michigan can get some production from 
players like Alexander or Uden or whoever's starting a designated player, they'll be in good shape this weekend. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and really, that's all they've needed is a solid performance on offense from whoever is behind the plate. You know, Subject also hit the ball pretty well over the weekend yeah. as well. Uh, and whether she's playing down at the hot quarter in place of Montemarano or behind the plate, it's still good to see offense coming from sort of more peripheral players for the time being. So uh, not much more to be said other than about these seniors, but we'll get into that a little bit later in the podcast. Uh, 3-0, that's the expectation. Should be. Yeah. I mean, it does... I don't think that there should be a ton of importance placed on, you know, the outcomes of these particular games. You know, the Big Ten tournament and, uh, you know, that big weekend road series at Rutgers. Bigger hey, fish to fry, maybe. Fence, fence the fence garden. the freaking garden. Just fence it. Yeah, so th- those will be big ones. Uh, but, yeah, Michigan should go for the sweep. We should be covering all of those games on WCBN. We've been a little lax in, in recent games, recent weeks, due to finals and due to departures, due to busy schedules. But we're going to be back and dedicated to this softball team for the remainder of the season for sure. I feel like it's been a while since there's been a home series at Alumni. I think the last one I remember... It was well. It was there was Penn a Michigan, State? yeah. There was a Michigan State game that we. Uh, I'm talking about series though. Yeah, the last home series was uh, Northwestern, Northwestern at the Wilton Wilton Complex, and that was back at the beginning of April. We're here at the end of April, uh, <laughs> leading into May against the Indiana Hoosiers. So it has been a while. I, I miss it. I miss it. I'm looking forward to getting back in the booth. Uh, but before we proceed, we're, we are gonna talk about the seniors and perhaps the most noteworthy senior on offense I guess I had to way to catch yourself there way to catch yourself Megan Betts is otherworldly anyway Kev talked to Kelly Christner today here is the audio from that interview so um, this year compared to last year, uh, you have two new outfielders out there with you. Uh, <laughs> what has the transition been like um, from left field to center field? Well, honest, honestly, a big part of it is, you know, playing with Kelsey and CeeLo for two straight years out there. You kind of know, you know, their abilities and like the range of that the range that they have and balls that you should be taking balls that they should be taking taking and you can kind of like keep the same mindset as them whereas this year you know going in I had two new players that I haven't played side by side with a lot Um, so I think I really had to take on a more leadership role and constantly focus on on them and not on myself and make sure that you know they're setting up in the right spot if it's a slap or making sure Courtney's moving in and I think just little things like that and it's actually been kind of fun because it kind of gets me away from my own game and you know focusing on them more which is you know more beneficial to the team obviously so not a big transition no it's not a big transition I've played center before you know all through high school and everything so like I've I've been comfortable playing there before you know so I think more of it was just the different players playing next to me so you mentioned Courtney and Natalie Uh, what can you say about them and just uh, what they've been able to do this year first year starters no they're both great you know coming in not having started before it's a lot to take on you know that was me my sophomore year and so I think you kind of can get caught up in the pressure and I think both of them haven't done that you know they both have stayed pretty level-headed you know they're constantly in the game and they're constantly keeping other people up which I think is very important they're not you know focusing on themselves which is helpful to the team you know so when Megan's in the circle do you ever just get bored out there because she strikes (laughs) out a bunch of people I I like have to keep myself engaged in it every single pitch you know I tell myself before every single pitch like the ball's coming to me because if I didn't do that I think I really would like get bored out there and kind of lose my head you know maybe look into the stands to see who's there so really I need to like lock in every pitch because sometimes it does get pretty pretty silent and dead out there so when Megan's in the circle compared to Tara do you are there big adjustments you have to make out there no not really I no matter who's pitching I tell myself you know balls coming to me every pitch just to keep me locked in and Tara's done a great job this year and I mean I haven't really gotten that many balls thinking about it when either of them has been pitching so I don't think there has been that big of a difference um, so this year offensively you've really taken a step forward um, has there been uh, one certain thing that you can attribute that that to not really I mean I 
focused over the summer about just getting my swing back to feeling comfortable and feeling athletic and powerful. And, you know, a lot of the thing last year was I was in my head a lot, you know, coming off of a really solid so sophomore year. It's kind of hard the next year to, you know, you want to reproduce those same results. And I think I kind of was dwelling on that instead of just focusing on the time I was in. So this year I came back completely, like, clear-minded and just with a fresh start, and I think that has really helped me out. Uh, looking at your place in the lineup, you've batted, you know, the three spot, the seven spot. We saw you in the leadoff spot mm -hmm. in Wisconsin. Do you have a, a particular favorite spot to bat in that you're most comfortable, or is it wherever Hutch? No, honestly, like wherever wherever I'm at, I think it's been beneficial for us to move it around because there have been different people that are hot every weekend. You know, we haven't had those, you know, two people that are just constantly on it like we have in the past. So I think switching it around is really helpful to us. So I think we've all just kind of just gone with the flow, you know, and just focusing on the spot you're in and having a solid at bat. So you kind of touched on it. Uh, the two games against Wisconsin, the lineup was all mm -hmm. jumbled around. Uh, was that, did it come as a surprise or was it a necessary change of pace or what were your thoughts on it? I think she was just trying to do something completely different than what we've been doing because we've, you know, there have been a lot of ups and downs this year and I think she was just trying to set a new tone and I think it really did help because we came out Saturday and Sunday and we looked great up and down the lineup and just our, you know, our energy and the vibe in the dugout was different. So I think it's been helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this weekend, Saturday is Kelly Christner Day. <laughs> what you, <laughs> yeah. Uh, What's it going to be like to see the entire crowd with those uh, Kelly Chris? Well, yeah, I actually just got—I just it's got not. a preview of it. Kelsey gave me one, but it's—it's going to be weird, you know. All my family is going to be here, so they're probably going to have a bunch just like jumping around at me. But I don't know. I think just the atmosphere at Alumni Field is always so amazing. So like, it's really not going to be any different than any other game. So one day forward, Sunday is Senior Day. Do you have a favorite moment? Favorite, uh, you know game at bat that you, you know, throughout your four years? Oh, man. Well, my freshman year, whenever we uh, played in regionals at Arizona State, and we took that from them, and honestly, the bus ride after that was one of my favorite moments of my four years here. I have i don't think I've ever had that much fun. Um, just seeing, like, Doyle catch the ball at the wall, and we all just celebrated so much. It was great. And then another thing, my sophomore year at the World Series, my first at bat, I was super nervous and I ended up hitting a home run and that just like, it was like a dream come true because you know every little girl dreams of you know hitting a home run at the World Series so I think that was another like moment that pops into my head. Um, so this past week you were drafted in the fourth round of the National Pro Fast Pitch Draft. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, what that means for your future softball career possibly? Well, yeah, I was I was actually pretty surprised um, that that happened. We were all, a bunch of us were watching it together and we were expecting Megan to be picked up and when she was, we were all, you know, happy for her and then we heard my name we were all like screaming and stuff. But I mean, I, I'm not gonna, I haven't made a decision yet and I don't really, I'm not gonna talk about that yet, but cause I wanna continue to right. focus on this until we're done. But I think just the honor of being drafted is, like, it, it's a great honor to me, and I'm very thankful that they did that. All right, last final question. So okay. we have a podcast-wide debate, uh, and I would like your input. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Uh, I say no. No? Off the top of my head, I'm saying no, but then I think about it, and it's like it's meat inside two buns. So See, the X's and O's, like once you get it, it is a sandwich, it's but it's not. All right, so no's the answer. I, I'm saying no. All right. I'm saying no. Fair enough. That's all I got. All right. Thank also, you very much. Yeah, thank you. So that was Kelly Christner, and it sounded, Kev, like if you had maybe given her some more time to piece through that hot dog sandwich debate, she might have come out on the right side of things. You know, it's it's not an easy question because I think your knee-jerk response is no, and I'm yeah. always anti-hot dog sandwich. Yeah. So your initial response is no, but then you think about it, and she was kind of working through it and, and almost switched me to the pro hot dog sandwich i think if if 30 more seconds if she would have worked through that one i might have i might have been switched 
Oh, it, it, despite all the, the years that I've spent trying to persuade you, Kelly could have gotten you in a well, few minutes. No, no, no. The other thing that really goes into it is Hutch thinks it's a sandwich as well. And yeah. That, sometimes I if if Hutch has the confidence to scramble the lineup like that and leave, leave magic. I leave two seniors out of the lineup. And produce magic, yeah. She, you know she, what? She's clearly thinking on a higher plane. We didn't even mention the freaking draft. Shows what we're doing here. Anyway, <laughs> the national fast the, pitch. That was draft. actually pretty cool because I we were talking about it before the actual draft, and like Kristner said in the interview, it was obvious that Betsa was going to be picked. Mm-hmm. But we were thinking Montemarano, maybe Ramirez, maybe Kristner was on that cusp, and. and it's a pretty, I mean, it's a cool thing. And if she chooses to take that opportunity, she'll be reunited with two notable Wolverines, Romero and Jordan Taylor. Yeah. Uh, Christner drafted number 20 overall by the USSSA Pride. Bets uh, number seven overall by the Akron Zips, who also not took- the Akron Zips. It's not the Akron. What do you mean the Akron Zips? That's the college team. It is. Oh, man, I I Googled Akron softball, and it came out with the Akron Zips, but it was probably referring to their college team. Anyway, it's the Akron, I I think it's the Akron Racers. Racers sounds sounds correct. Yes, that's what it was. My bad. I mean, you said Racers, Zips, they're all moving fast. I totally understand that you could have messed that up. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, And with the number two overall pick, they also selected Sarah Gronawagen, so... Uh, a Big Ten duo coming in hot on the pro softball scene. It, it was actually a pretty cool thing because five Big Ten players were selected in the draft. The two Wolverines, Grona Wagon, Knighton from Nebraska, and... Oh, yeah, no. I might, might have to think for a second. I can't remember who the fifth one is, but it, it shows Big Ten softball. I don't think it gets a good rap, but you know what? I mean, there's some very good, talented players in it. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we've seen it throughout the years. We only get a little bit of exposure to them, but it's it's good to see that they're getting the recognition they deserve. Uh, but, yeah, so Kristner, uh, I think I, I liked that she had to really think about her favorite moments of her career, uh, and that got us thinking that maybe we should do the same for all of the seniors, That you know, given that it, it is senior day coming up, the last home series for all of them, you know, aside from the Big Ten tournament, which is something else entirely. So uh, we went with our favorite moments from each senior. That is our only segment that we'll be doing Chloe this Miller. episode. Sorry. That was, I just I had to get oh, it out there. Oh, Chloe Miller, yeah, Wisconsin's catcher. Damn, she's a good player. Yeah, she is, and I'm glad you brought that up. But uh, anyway, we'll start with Kelly Christner, the subject of the interview. Hers were... Uh, uh, a college World Series instance as a freshman, a, a sophomore as or a home run as a sophomore. Uh, we weren't able to be quite as sentimental because you know we aren't her, uh, <laughs> and I've only been following this team with great detail over the past few years. You know, I kind of missed her whole freshman year. Uh, but anyway, my favorite moment for Kelly Christner was this year uh, when she came out and silenced all of the doubters and hit three home runs in one game against NC State. Uh, there was a lot. There were a lot of questions surrounding the lineup this year, and maybe not first and foremost, but a big one was whether or not Krishna would be able to recapture her sophomore form. She had a an inconsistent opening weekend, and then bam, the second weekend of the year, uh, really uh, kind of vaulted herself into the top of this Michigan lineup, and you know, kind of kept Michigan in the national conversation for a while at least. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I'll go with. Back sophomore year, like I, I think we talk about two years ago when they made that big run, and it wasn't just because we were hopping on the bandwagon or anything like that, but that's when all of us really got into it and started following it. And I remember they were in the Super Regional against Georgia, and she hit a big, uh, I believe a big home run, or at least tied the game. And I think that was a really cool moment because you look at that entire lineup of – I guess the noteworthy players. Everyone thinks of Sierra Romero, but for some, for a, a sophomore having such a good season like Christner did to hit a big home run, I, I think that was a really cool moment. I'll go with that one. All right. So senior number two, we went with Lindsay Montemarano. Uh, she has really, uh, she's been a bit inconsistent over the years for the Wolverines, but 
really a spark plug when she's gotten into the lineup. My favorite moment of hers was one that is somewhat uncharacteristic of her personal play style. She's not, you know, a big bopper who's constantly threatening to drive the ball out of the park. But last year against the Missouri Tigers in the regional, she hit a home run in both games of Michigan's, you know, 2-0 series victory to move on. Uh, and, you know, it, it kind of epitomized what she's about. You know, she, she will do what it takes to help the team win, whether it be getting on base and or, you know, hitting a home run in a clutch situation. She's come through time and time again, and I expect more from her in this postseason, but uh, that was a pretty cool moment from her. Now, are you just saying that because you have a signed scorecard from that game when you called it right behind you right now? Maybe. What's it to you? I'm just asking. Um, fair. I guess full disclosure. I remember last year I was covering a weekend series against Northwestern for Student U, and Monta Morano, for some reason, she just goes off against Big Ten opponents, and she had some crazy uh, series against Northwestern. She was hitting home runs, doubles, driving in like five, six, seven runs, and I think Michigan lost a game like 13 to 12. But she hit either a three-run home run or a grand slam to make it close. And mm-hmm. it was such a cool thing because Michigan didn't, their offense didn't start to like the fifth inning. But the series she had was absolutely incredible. And I think one thing we should always mention about Mata Morano that's fun to watch is just how damn good defensively she is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and I think we will get an opportunity to talk to her about that hopefully next week. Somewhere down the road, we're hoping to interview Lindsay Mata Morano. Uh, we got some good questions for her. But yeah, uh, a spark plug. All in, in that Northwestern series, I looked it up. She got on base all but one plate appearance, which really is the ultimate Lindsey Montemarano on offense. Uh, senior number three, Abby Ramirez. Uh, there was maybe not a lot of super-duper highlights to choose from. It's more her consistency in the field, her ability to start rallies at the top of the order and the bottom of the order that makes her such a valuable piece of this lineup for me my favorite moment of her was perhaps the moment when she stepped out of character the most and that was back in 2015 a three-game series against Rutgers she hit two balls out of the park a slapper going yard uh the only two home runs of her Michigan career probably will remain the only two home runs of her Michigan softball career Uh, she's gonna make you eat your words right like this weekend she's gonna hit two home runs uh no way, I would be uh I would be shocked. It would it would one go home against... run. I'm saying, <laughs> call it right. Hot take one home run against Indiana. Yeah, well I'll believe it when I see it, and I will give you all credit if it happens. But yeah, fair I, enough. I just I I liked it because it was such a curious thing. I you know what I couldn't think of of one moment. I'm gonna go with the defense again. I'm I'm harping on the defense, but that left side of the. Diamond for Michigan defensively is just so stellar and it starts with Ramirez up the middle I can't count the number of double plays that she has been able to turn or start from that shortstop position Which is so hard to do in any you know baseball or softball, especially softball and I the the one that comes to mind is the Diving play against Florida State earlier this year. That was a pretty nice one. Yeah, for sure uh Moving on, Megan Betza. We've already said, we've probably talked more about Megan Betza on this podcast than we have any other player on this team, and she merits all of that attention. For me, the quintessential Megan Betza moment was at the beginning of this season against Florida, and there are so many games to choose from, but that was the top-notch competition, and she came out, she put the team on her back, held down you know, one of the better offenses, one of the best teams in the country, for nine innings an absolute gamer Michigan ended up losing the game and you know that that also kind of captures their uh, their season you know to some degree but yeah that's a unreal competitor and it springboarded her into the season that she's had uh you know what it's we have seen Megan Betza pride twice every weekend for the past four years and I my my favorite moment happened this year. I we were covering the game for Student U. I got to call the game against Kent State, and it was her no hitter. She set her career or career mark for strikeouts at the time at seventeen. That's since been eclipsed. Like you know, she just doesn't like the to keep in one place. But uh, to call that no hitter and to 
to be able to witness a pitcher who is so dominant and you have full confidence in when she's in the circle has been really cool. I mean that I've I've been able to witness in person two of her five no hitters and that's yeah that's pretty pretty cool. She's like the only pitcher where she can strike out double digit hitters in one game and pitch a shutout and you'll be like eh. you know she was kind of off today yeah that's the thing the other week we were talking about that on the podcast i mean she yeah it, it was, was michigan against michigan state, state. I think, yeah she gave up a run she struck out like what 11 or something and yeah it was like yeah she didn't really have her best stuff today and with her and just being a strikeout pitcher it just hammers home the point on how beneficial it is and what an advantage it is to have a strikeout pitcher in the circle because she keeps base runners put yeah her her command can be off a little bit she can walk the bases loaded and trust me we have seen her walk the bases loaded but she doesn't give up any runs she strikes out the side yeah and you know in a year where michigan's defense has been maybe a little bit more suspect it's helped to iron over any any difficulties that they've had in the transition from having you know the likes of lawrence and romero and susala out there so uh, that's actually pretty much all we have for you on the pod today. We're going to finish with the usual one thing we learned and one thing that we still would like to know. Uh, and I will start with one thing I have learned. And uh, I guess, you know, in doing the research for the pod, I, I learned about, uh, well, first of all, all of the Big Ten players getting drafted. But second of all, I learned the extent of Montemarano's dominance against Northwestern last year. Uh you know, it's probably something I realized when it happened, but it's good to, to recall those sorts of things and celebrate, you know, the peaks of these players' careers. Uh, and one thing I still want to know, uh, I want to know how the heck Abby Ramirez is going to hit a home run this weekend because I don't think it's coming out of the park. You watch. We'll see. One thing I learned today is that... Uh, <laughs> Fun. I got to watch the end of practice and Hutch was very adamant that if any ruckus was going on and graduation morning that she would take care of it. That's one thing I learned. Huh. And the one thing I want to know is who is going to win the Uden versus Uden battle this weekend. Oh man. I I, I hope that they give Why Maddie did we talk about that? All three kinds, all three starts. Yeah, we, we should have talked more about when well, we still got some time. I got I got the end music queued up, but like you know what what else is there to say? Maddie Unin coming on hot, Taylor Uden coming in hot. Uh, I expect that both will bring their best. I mean, wh- what else is there to say? Is I so Maddie is a freshman. Taylor's a junior. I thought she was a senior. That would have been like you know the changing of the guard yeah, of yeah. the Uden family you know we, we saw that a bit with i thought we kind of saw that with this team but then you know the old guard got subbed in like an inning and a half into the game and then Michigan won against Wisconsin and then the next day it was pretty much business as usual but at least it kind of shows that the that uh, you know the next step is in good hands is Isn't there, it? especially with Carol, Carol Hutchins at the helm got a great recruiting class coming in I, okay, I know we're we're take you know another sidebar here before we get off. Isn't it funny that there are multiple like sister versus sister inner Big Ten play rivalries? Yeah, you don't really see that kind of thing with uh, with many other sports. I yeah I I mean you know you got the Christners with Wisconsin, you got the Udens with uh, with Indiana, uh, and I, I know I'm probably missing some others, but. Uh, yeah, it's something. Like I feel like it, it's interesting because I feel like once once like one sibling goes to a certain school, it's conference the, loyalty in the yeah, family. Yeah, like the other the other sibling will try to go to that school as well. I don't know. It's very interesting. Watch yeah. out for that Yoon versus Yoon matchup. Yeah, too bad uh we didn't see uh, another Romero in the Big 10. See Romero went down if, to Oklahoma. If she would have she I was another sidebar, sorry, just <laughs> sidebars ahead. for days here. I watched her against Baylor the yeah. other day. She is such a good softball player. Yeah. She's just fun to watch. Sierra was fun to watch, so is Sydney. Yeah. Good uh, softball family. Could have sparked just a total Big Ten revolution if she had stuck in conference. Michigan could have used her too. Damn, that would but, have been, uh, that would have been unfair. It would yeah. have been unfair to the rest yeah, of the Big Ten. Yeah, that, that, watch out, Sarah Grunewagen. Yeah, well, 
We'll uh, hope for a transfer in the future, but uh, for now, that's all we have for you. For Kevin Klein, I'm Morris Fabry. Wishing you a good night, a a go blue. Thanks for tuning in, and be sure to tune into our coverage of the softball team this weekend as they take on the Indiana Hoosiers at Alumni Field. One morning I woke up and I knew you were gone. A new day, a new way.